Well, this here started out, uh, I guess it's a sad story. The day after his mother-in-law disappeared in a kayaking accident uh, off the coast of, or in, the lake, in a lake at Newfoundland, this guy answered the door to find two grim-faced Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers. We're sorry, Mr. Flynn, but we have some information about your mother-in-law, one of the officers said. And uh, so he's bracing himself. Tell me, did you find her? And the Mounties looked at each other and one said, we have some bad news, some good news, and some really good news. Which would you like to hear first? And he said, uh, give me the bad news first. So the officer said, I'm sorry to tell you, sir, but this morning we found your mother-in-law's body in the bay. Oh no, he exclaimed swallowing hard he said what could possibly be the good news and the officer said when we pulled her up she had 12 of the best looking Atlantic lobsters that you've ever seen hanging on her we haven't seen lobsters like that since the 1960s and we feel you're entitled to a share in the catch stunned Mr. Flynn demanded well if that's the good news then what's the great news and the officer replied, we're going to pull her up again tomorrow. <laughs> that wasn't nice, was it? <laughs> but it was funny because you're all laughing. <laughs> My wife didn't think that was nice. And she's over here laughing, too. Psalm 5117, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we thank you for the honor and privilege of carrying these morsels from your word into the family today. And we pray that you'll have your way with the word as it goes forth. Give us hungry hearts. Give us willingness to respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you want someone to say of you that you have a noble character? What would they mean by that, referring to you? That person has a normal, a normal, yeah, noble, <laughs> noble character. Would someone notice your character by the way you walk? Would that cause them to say you have a noble character? Would they notice your character by how you hold your jaw? Would they notice your character by the expression on your face? Well, maybe. Would someone notice your character by how you react to situations? Well, we're getting closer. Situations in your life, situations in somebody else's life, how you react to those. Well, the writer of Acts, and that was Luke, gives some insight into what noble character looks like, at least what it looked like in Berea. So we're in, we're in Acts chapter 17. We were in Acts chapter 17 last week too, but we're in the next part. In verse 10, it says, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Remember, they were being threatened in Thessalonica, so they sent them away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Noble character. As a result, in verse 12, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women, And many Greek men, verse 13, but when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul 
to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. So prior to this, Paul and Silas were in Thessalonica, where they had some success in convincing some of the Jews uh, and other people, they call them Greeks, but that means the, the, uh, the uh, Gentiles, that Jesus was the Messiah. As usual, there was opposition. There's always opposition. And Paul and Silas were sent away by night. They were sent to Berea. Now remember that Jesus had said in Matthew 10, 23, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you that you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So Jesus recommended if you're persecuted when you're carrying the gospel to go to another, go to somewhere else. So Paul and Silas went from place to place um, because, they, because violence came and opposition came. And, and against them, and more particularly against the message itself. The opposition was against the message. The opposition was against the gospel itself. Everyone who shares the gospel faces opposition. If you share the gospel, you face opposition because there's an enemy that doesn't want you spreading it around. We faced opposition when the churches were closed down because of COVID. That was an opposition. Many churches didn't survive that. I'm worn out after I preach a sermon. I'm fatigued. It's fatiguing. <clears throat> I've talked to other ministers and they say the same thing. Emotional fatigue. Because there's opposition. You have to struggle to get the sermon together. And there's, a, there's an opposition to delivering the sermon. Because the enemy doesn't want the victory to come through the word. And when I go home on Sunday afternoon, I fall asleep. I might intend to watch the game, turn it on, I fall asleep. It's, a, it's fatigue, emotional fatigue. It's not something strenuous, physical, but there's opposition. Some churches face opposition in the membership of the church. Well-meaning people, believers oppose. Maybe a new pastor comes or uh, a new means of doing things. I call it comfort zone-itis. <laughs> comfort zone-itis is a church killer. It really is. We've seen it happen. In verse 10, they went to the Jewish synagogue as, as their custom was. They always went to a Jewish synagogue or a Jewish, you know, a, a body of believers if they could find them. Find them. And um, the Jewish had a body of belief, uh, beliefs, body of beliefs that anticipated the coming of the Messiah. They had the prophecies, they had the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, and they had the prophecies that, that pointed to the Messiah. So Paul went to the Jews in each city first. He went to them first to convince them that the Messiah had already come and that it was in fact Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And there were Gentiles who would convert also to Jesus. The message is a good message. And why would a Gentile say, well, that's not for me? So there were Gentiles who were of noble character and accepted the message and became Christian believers. So Paul and Silas went from Thessalonica because of the uproar that was created by the unconverted Jews that came from Thessalonica, and so they went from Thessalonica to Berea. In verse 11, they found the Jews there to be of noble character. It says more noble character than the, the Thessalonians. It just says more, of more noble character. Actually, according to the word, they were... Um, well, how, however you want to think of a noble character, nobility means to be born of a high estate. 
But there was a there was part of this word right here that tells you why they were more noble. So what could the Jew, could the Berean Jews be doing that the Thessalonian Jews were not doing? What was it about the character of the Berean Jews that made them more noble? Could it be that some of the Jews of Thessalonica were jealous and caused an uprising? Maybe. But there were supportive Jews in Thessalonica too because they started a church there and it was still going on. And in the other cities where they had been, they had started churches and there were supportive Jews and there were opposing Jews. Judaizers, we call them at the present time, meaning, uh, meaning that within the church, there was a, a, a segment of Jewish people that thought you had to become a Jew first and be, and be, gen, be um, uh, circumcised and then become a Christian. And Paul fought against those people. Well, anyway, in verse 11, it's explained why these Berean Jews were of more noble character. This is now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For, here's what it is. Now, they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul, if what Paul said was true. Oh, the Bereans were scripture examiners. That's what earned them the description, noble characters. The Messiah has come. Get all excited. Wait, let's check it out in the scripture. Paul said the Messiah has come. He talked about Jesus. Wait a minute. Let's check it out in the scripture. All I got to do is read Isaiah. But this is good news, but let's make sure it's true. Let's make sure the scriptures are fulfilled. That's why they were considered to have more noble character. They received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scripture. The Jews everywhere grew up with the stories. They knew the verses that predicted the coming of the Messiah. The people didn't have personal copies of the word like we do, but at least in Berea, they had access to the word in a synagogue. Can you picture them gathered around, checking the verses that Paul used in preaching to them? And every day they did that. Have you ever seen the scrolls? I had a, I think I told you this a couple weeks ago, I had a privilege of going into a Jewish synagogue, Temple Beth Israel. The rabbi's name was Rabbi Gary Klein, a sweetheart of a guy. And he, I had to wear the thing. I don't, I don't remember what you call it, a yarmulke or something like that. They took me up on a platform. There's a window back there with a drape. And he opened the drape and the scrolls were in there. And he pulled out the scroll. There were other scrolls in it. He pulled out the ones that were the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and he explained to me what they were. I was so honored. And he put those on a big stand. They were heavy. Each scroll was about this big around, and there were two of them where they would wind them back and forth, and they were heavy. And he put them on a stand, and he took this cover off. It was like a purple velvet cover, and we had some chains and silver things on it. I think it might even had little bells on it, but it was decorated. Took that off. He called that the undressing of the scrolls. Took the scrolls and laid them down on his platform, his pulpit-like, and opened them up. And they had a, it was a pointer, like a silver pen, and on the end of it was a was a hand with a finger like that, and they would use that to go along. And, and it was in it was in Hebrew, and it was on I don't know what that was if that was parchment it was heavy material and it was hand written in the Hebrew characters. Awesome, I said, I felt so privileged. But that is what these people gathered around to examine the scriptures because they didn't have a Bible like we have. But it was so important to them. They received the word with eagerness, but they wanted to check it out because the word was the final authority for them. 
as it is for us. Good for you, Bereans. Amen. The Jews of Berea were being compared to the Jews of Thessalonica. The Berean Jews allowed themselves to think um, in an unbounded way. They were open to reason. They didn't resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were willing to subscribe to what appealed to them as truth, even though it was contrary to their former sentiments, to what they had previously thought. And this was more noble. They received the message with great eagerness, it said. These are just words on paper, but we need to identify with the emotion. It says they received it with great eagerness. Those are just words when we read it in the, in the word. But you need to identify with the emotion that's going on here. Great eagerness. When did you last anticipate something with that kind of eagerness? When you were little and Santa Claus was coming? <laughs> you remember that was great eagerness. I remember one time I'm, I was, I must have been about six or seven, and um, I took a bowl, uh, a cereal bowl, and put a washcloth in it in water, and I kept putting my eyes so I wouldn't fall asleep. I didn't want to be asleep. <laughs> anyway, great eagerness. Santa Claus is coming. Or graduation. The senior I've been at I've been at well for for forty-five years. And I don't know how many graduations each year, but I've been at a lot of graduations. Great eagerness, all those twelve years. Twelve years. You excited to be done with it. I sure was. Birth of a child. The woman needs deliverance. <laughs> Great eagerness. Or a wedding. Great eagerness. Getting married. Or your kids can tie their own shoelaces. <laughs> That's a milestone in your life because a kid can tie his own shoelaces. When we were in Illinois, they couldn't pass kindergarten unless they could tie their own shoelaces. They had to tie their own shoelaces, count to ten, and something else. Or they, or they had to repeat kindergarten. <laughs> tie their own shoe. What else? What? Else? Say the alphabet. Oh, they had to say the entire alphabet. But that shoelace thing, if they didn't, if they didn't tie them, <laughs> they would repeat <laughs> kindergarten. Uh, at least that's what they said. Our kids were able to do that. So could you identify with the eagerness of the Berean Jews? You know in your own heart what eagerness you've had for different things. Have you ever been eager to hear a word from the scripture? Have you been just eager to hear a word? Just think about that. Have you ever been just, ah, I need to hear a word. Or I need somebody to pray for me. Some of the Jews in Thessalonica heard the word, responded to it, but there's no indication of eagerness or emotion. That doesn't mean they weren't. It just means it doesn't say that. So why did the Berean Jews have such anticipation, such eagerness receiving the word? I can only think that the Holy Spirit was at work in them. That he was already pulling at the veils in their hearts. I can remember the excitement I felt when my friend took me to his church. I was so excited when he invited me because I knew something would happen in my life that would make it so different. And it did. So they examined the scriptures every day. How is it that the Jews in the other towns that Paul visited didn't anticipate the message like the Berean Jews did? It seems they were open-hearted. The other Jews were a little bit resistant. Some of them, the Holy Spirit wore down the resistance, and some of them would receive the message, and some of the, what they call Greeks, would receive it. But 
there was an open heartedness in these Bereans to hear what was being said and to check it out in the word and to respond to it. So they didn't, it seems like they didn't hold on to cherished notions, to rigid attitudes like some of the other Jews did and like some of us do. It seems that the Bereans weren't stuck in old ideas or traditional ways of doing things like the Jews in Jerusalem and other places were. Instead of their own traditions, instead of putting so much weight on their own traditions, they examined the scriptures to see if what Paul was preaching uh, or teaching was the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, to the Jews who and yeah, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've all been set free from the truth. From the truth. I think everyone has a desire to know the truth. You know, we go to school, we read, read books, we go, we go to the internet, we seek experts out in certain things, and we believe people that we admire. The truth seems elusive sometimes. Things change. You remember when experts were claiming that we should use margarine instead of butter? Remember that? Because of cholesterol and butter. And then they changed their mind a few, a few years later that, that, the, that margarine was hard to digest. It was more harmful to you and you better use butter. Right. <laughs> Some are convinced that socialism, Marxism, is the best thing for humanity. History disproves that theory, but millions still cling to it. How do you know the truth? In some things, you can't. Science rediscovers things. What was science, truth, at this point in history has been disproven by a new science truth. It changes. New research comes along, theories change. In spiritual things, God's Word, our Bible, is the only perfect truth. See, I looked right at you because I knew an amen would come from right there. I got my little sign here, but... The truth that will make you free. Free from the law of sin and death, the Brian Jews were considered more noble, not because they trusted, um, or because they trusted in the scriptures. They consulted scripture every day, checking for themselves what Paul was saying. They gathered around those scrolls, and it's laborious to move those from one to another without ripping anything. So theories come and theories go about everything in the world. But the word of God is absolutely complete and true. It's the only thing we can utterly depend on. Psalm 11989, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And the King James, your word is forever settled in heaven. I love that scripture. In all matters eternal. In all matters spiritual, the only unchanging permanent truth is that we can depend on the Word of God. God's Word is my all-sufficient rule for faith and practice, period. Every prophecy, every word of knowledge, every teaching must be proven in the Word. And yes, every sermon that your pastor preaches should be checked in the word. Don't take my word for it. I'm reading a scripture, but you should check it for yourself. Open your Bible. Open your, I have a Bible in my phone. Open it and see. What's he saying? Don't take my word for it. That's what the Berean Jews were doing. 
they were checking it out for themselves. They had access to the word and, and they said, well, let's see. And the eagerness it started with came from the Holy Spirit. The word came through Paul and the word that they had in the synagogue was what they consulted to make sure that what Paul was saying was true. And that's why they were thought more noble than the Thessalonian Jews. The result was this in verse, or number three, in verse uh, 12. Many of them were convinced they embraced Jesus as the Messiah. As a result, verse 12, as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. That's just a, a way that they referred to the Gentiles, Greeks. Because they gave weight to the scripture, because Paul's messages were in line with the scripture, many were saved, including the Gentiles. God's word, God's servants, and God's victory. It's all God. Some troublemaker Jews from Thessalonica who had not believed and not received the word and not checked it out with the Bible, with their, with their scriptures, went to Berea. These were, these were people who were clinging to their old ideas. They went to Berea. There's always opposition. The enemy works over time. He tries to destroy the work of God in us, in you, in the church. Sometimes he succeeds in that. The way the churches are shrinking these days is because people are more oriented to their own attitude than they are in serving God. They'll think, oh, we don't need to hear this. We have our own way of doing things. Oh, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Oh, your ideas are too old-fashioned. Oh, I have my own lifestyle. Where do you think these ideas, this resistance to the word comes from? The exact same place that the Jewish resistance in Thessalonica, the same place it came from. The old, old enemy of the gospel. Hopefully, we are more noble than the Thessalonian Jews. Hopefully, we are more, no, more noble. But that is because we examine the scriptures. If you don't examine the scriptures, then maybe you're not more noble. We have to always examine the scriptures. Glean truth out of it for your day, for your development, for your character. Character in character changes. You can you can uh, embitter yourself and have a bitter character. You can, as a response to things that you see on the internet, on the news, or wherever. Response to things. You can be embittered and have an embittered character. Or you can let the, the word reign in you and glean peace from it. Hopefully, we always examine the scriptures. Yeah, it's, for, it's, it's, it's the answer to everything. So let's make a new determination to do that. To be people of the word, you know, people who know the word, read the word, apply the truth of the word to themselves, apply it. it says, be not only hearers, but doers of the word. If the word doesn't reign in your heart, then you need a change. <laughs> if the word doesn't reign, in your heart, over everything else, over your other thoughts, then you need a change toward the Word. It's, it's, it's God's life. It's God's nourishment for your soul. Things can be going along just peachy. And if you're not in the Word, 
Well, survival may, may be in question and you don't even know it. The survival of your soul. Would you stand? If you want to make a new determination, a new determination, if you haven't been reading the Word every day, then you need a new, a new determination to do that. Or maybe you need God to bless it to you. If you have a heart that way, that you want to make a new determination to be more noble because you examine the Scriptures daily, if you want to do that, then come forward and spend a little bit of time in prayer around here. If you want to be a person, if you want a, more deter new, a new determination to be more a more word person, to be more oriented toward the gospel, then take a step. Just take a step and come down and gather around and pray for a few minutes. If you want to be that person, thank you, Jesus.